Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts, a free educational netcast bringing geology to all. Some of the earliest tools that our species learned to make include tools made out of rock, made out of sedimentary rock specifically, flint. Our species learned to make knives, axes, spear points, arrow points eventually, using this common type of rock. And this is actually a kind of sedimentary rock, although you might not know it to look at it. Flint is in a category of sedimentary rocks that we refer to as chemical and biological sedimentary rocks, broadly speaking. In a previous episode, I talked about detrital clastic sedimentary rocks. Rocks that are detrital, meaning they form a sedimentary rock originally as eroded bits and pieces from something else. They get collected together in a geologic basin, build up, are compacted over time as they're buried, and become solid rock. I'm talking about a different kind of sedimentary rock in this episode. I'm talking about non-detrital and in most cases, non-clastic sedimentary rocks. Some are clastic and some are not, but we're talking about chemical sedimentary rocks, a very different kind of thing. And flint is an example. If it's light-colored, we tend to call it chert. If it's darker, it tends to be called flint. If it's red, people call it jasper. And if it's banded, people call it agate, a semi-precious stone. But it's silica. It's SiO2 silica deposited as a product of biology, in this case, the microscopic shells of single-celled and otherwise microscopic organisms, plankton, such as diatoms, who in life weave around themselves a shell of silica. Glass sponges do basically the same thing as diatoms. They produce a shell of silica. As time rolls on, the dead remains of diatoms fall to the bottom of the ocean and collect up as a deposit of silicious ooze. And eventually that gets buried, and that can get compacted. Water is driven out. It's hardened into solid rock. It's a chemical sedimentary rock. It didn't form out of pieces that were eroded from elsewhere. It, it formed from SiO2, deposited into ocean water in a dissolved form from the erosion of mountain ranges, this dissolved silica, precipitated from seawater by the agency of trillions of tiny diatom phytoplankton and other organisms that produce glass and hardens into what we used as a young species to make tools because you can shatter it, you can make sharp edges with it because it's basically a kind of glass. There are many other kinds of chemical and biochemical sedimentary rocks out there too. The most abundant and most common that everyone could easily recognize is limestone. In a previous lecture, I talked about how limestone plays a role as the largest reservoir of carbon in the Earth's crust, and it's a sedimentary rock. It's clastic or non-clastic, depending upon how it forms, but it's calcium carbonate. A lot of the limestone that we have in the world is the result, mostly, about 90% is not chemically precipitated from ocean water. About 90% of it is biological. It is composed of trillions upon trillions of single-celled planktonic shells made of calcium carbonate that they weave around themselves in life, and when they die, they rot, but the shell remains. So this material can accumulate and does on the ocean floor, forming vast deposits of calcium carbonate, including not just plankton, not just microscopic objects like that, but actually fairly large objects. You can have the shells of mollusks or crustaceans or anything that lived in that ocean environment is made of the same calcium carbonate. So that's how often a lot of fossils get preserved, as they are hard parts of the material that is making up the entirety of the rock. If it's non-clastic, we're talking about calcium carbonate that can form chemically. It can precipitate directly out of ocean water, forming a chemical precipitate. Not that different from salt water drying in air, leaving behind salt crystals. Water that concentrates by evaporation will begin to precipitate out chemically the different salts that are within it. Rock salt is one, I'll get back to that, gypsum, another, and limestone. And this can happen either in a drying, hot, arid climate in a restricted estuary. It can also happen as a result of calcium carbonate being dissolved in water and then precipitating out as the water dries or cools. In usually conditions of high salinity in restricted estuary environments or similar situations where you've got a lot of evaporation and if there's a lot of calcium in that water it'll 
precipitate out as an inorganic calcium carbonate, very fine grained, or even not even fine grained, more like a colloid like flint. And so you can have microcrystalline limestone as a kind of non-clastic chemical sedimentary rock, such as in cave formations and how they grow, stalactites and stalagmites, and travertine, which is a kind of chemical precipitate sedimentary rock, calcium carbonate, limestone. But it will precipitate, for example, in hot spring, where the hot water is charged with calcium carbonate, and it rises to the surface, bubbles out onto the surface, flows away, but is cooling to room temperature where the supersaturated material calcium carbonate will solidify out of solution and form deposits of limestone rock without life having anything directly to do with it. Another kind of chemical sedimentary rock that most people are quite familiar with is rock salt or halite, NaCl, sodium chloride. The same processes that can dry bodies of water in arid evaporating climates leaving behind their minerals precipitated out from solution as a solid rock. Among the many rock types that we can get from that process, including limestone, is, of course, rock salt. And vast deposits of rock salt occur on Earth. We call them evaporites. Any kind of rock that forms by the direct drying of water and precipitation of minerals from it, we call an evaporite. And halite, rock salt, is a kind of evaporite, as well as gypsum. Chemically precipitated limestone is a kind of chemical precipitate. And when these kinds of rocks form, they're forming in a body of water that is essentially filling up with salt as it's drying. That material gets compressed down over time, forms layers of rock that can be easily mined. And of course, salt has been a valuable commodity in human civilization for thousands of years. Gypsum is another chemical sedimentary rock that precipitate in evaporite systems, and it is calcium sulfate that's hydrated with water molecules. Gypsum is a soft mineral. It's used actually in the making of drywall. Blocks of it are used as a construction material, as in building stone, and it's been used since the ancient world as a way to produce concrete. It's one of the constituents of plaster of Paris, and for sculpture, white gypsum of high quality is called alabaster and it works well uh, to make sculptures with because it's such a soft stone. Why do chemical sedimentary rocks have the compositions they have? Why is it that we have halite rock salt, calcium carbonate, calcium sulfate forming from seawater? Why those? Well, if you look at seawater's composition, it's actually pretty interesting. It's not just sodium chloride. If you look at the composition of Earth's seawater, in every liter of seawater, about a kilogram weight of seawater, is about 35 grams of salt. That's the salinity of ocean water on our planet. Most of that salt is sodium chloride. Quite a bit of it is. But actually, there's a fair bit of dissolved calcium, potassium, magnesium, sulfate, and other minor constituents in seawater. Every sample of seawater is going to contain not just what we think of as table salt. It's going to contain the dissolved chemicals, dissolved ions that can precipitate out to form solid calcium sulfate rock, calcium carbonate rock, rock salt. There's not a lot of other things you can directly precipitate. The oceans of our planet have a very specific composition, and there are only a few kinds of minerals that you can typically get when you start drying that seawater, among which are limestone, uh, rock salt, halite, sylvite, potassium chloride can also form, and gypsum, as I mentioned before but not much else. A few odd types of soda minerals you can form in drying lakes. Mono Lake in California is a famous example of this, where an inland lake with no water outlet simply builds up salt from water washing into it over years and years, becoming saltier and saltier. And as it dries in that arid climate, lays down deposits of salts, soda salt, things like trona, uh, borax, and other minerals that are characteristic not of oceans drying and leaving evaporites behind, but of lakes doing so. Another kind of biologically produced sedimentary rock is coal. Coal is sedimentary because it started off as plants, land plants like peat and peat bogs, or forest vegetation, such as we get a lot of coal from the Carboniferous vast forests that covered the earth at that time. Biological material like plant remains, leaf litter, peat that accumulates enough will begin to compress down under its own weight and will begin to chemically alter, driving water out of it, and begins a process of conversion from raw plant material into what eventually will become coal. Under pressure, it compresses into eventually lignite. Lignite is what we call brown coal. It's soft, it's fairly young, only a few million years old maybe, and it is recognizably plant material. There's actual bits of plant remains that can be seen in lignite. If lignite is allowed to age and compress under greater pressures, deeper in the earth for longer, it'll begin to lose a lot of its water. The oxygen begins to depart from the rock and is driven off in fluids in the porous rock, leaving behind mostly just the carbon. 
a carbon-rich black residue. Continued burial and compression of lignite eventually leads to the formation of subbituminous and then bituminous coal. Bituminous coal is probably what people are most familiar with when you think of the term coal. It's sooty, it's black, it produces a lot of dust, and it is one of the most abundant kinds of coal in the world. It has been used for decades, in fact, to power the Industrial Revolution. Although it does contain a lot of sulfur and is typically pretty polluting. If bituminous coal is allowed to age for longer even and start to undergo what is essentially low-grade metamorphism, you drive out even the sulfur. You drive out everything except the carbon and you can come up with some very high-grade coal called anthracite. Anthracite coal, it's not sooty. If you held a piece in your hand, you wouldn't actually get, have any come off onto your skin. It's a shiny light rock. Anthracite is the highest grade of coal. You get the most energy out of burning it compared to other grades of coal, and there's very little sulfur. It's very desirable. If you take biomass and compress it down long enough and put it through metamorphism, something like anthracite or deposits of carbon residue like that will be compressed further down to form essentially graphite, layers of thin graphite, which were layers of sedimentary algal mat material at one time. In some of the oldest rocks on Earth, you can find layers of graphite, which at one time were algal mats in the ancient oceans of our world.